this sermon on a spot thing. Uh, the inspiration really came uh, from my time away at the monastery for this past uh, 10 days. So many of you know uh, that I applied to, to be a part of a, a kind of a pilot program in the United States for clergy to go and spend time uh, with an intentional community in the middle of Wisconsin for 10 days to learn about uh, spiritual disciplines and faith practices. And in particular, the spiritual discipline and faith uh, practices of the Benedictine uh, community uh, who gets their orders and rules from St. Benedict who lived a long, long time ago. Uh, and it was an amazing uh, week away. I really missed folks here. Uh, but the community that I found myself was uh, found myself in was amazing. Uh, there we learned about uh, contemplative prayer. Uh, we spent two entire days, or th it was really more like 36 hours, in complete silence, which was wonderful. Um, I didn't even uh, look at my iPad for those 36 hours, which is kind of like a world record for me. Um, we uh, spent some time in community prayer. We did some uh, service opportunities. We, we uh, participated in, in uh, a huge feeding program in Madison called River, um, which was fascinating. And we spent a lot of time also talking about uh, ministry and what ministry looked like in the context that we were all serving in and, and challenges we faced in ministry and joys. Um, and it was a it was a really long uh, kind of Act week. And um, the last workshop that we did together uh, as a community um, of gathered clergy was called Ministry uh, as Improv. And they had uh, found an, uh, someone from Second City in Chicago to come and be with us, 19 clergy people who led us through improv, improv exercises, right? Now, um, some clergy have a really good sense of humor. Some are really serious, so you could probably imagine it was a pretty mixed bag of laughter and what the heck is going on uh, during that um, during uh, that that time. Um, but then the improv uh, teacher at the end kind of wrapped it up and said, "You know, I, I assume that many of you are very careful and deliberate about your work, and, and that's why people appreciate appreciate your leadership. But where?" In that leadership, is there room for you to play? Where in your leadership is there room for you to let the Holy Spirit in? Where in your leadership is there times when you can mess up and it's okay? Or where you can admit that you might be wrong and it's okay? We thought about that for a while, and then he made a challenge to each one of us and he said, Well, I encourage you someday to prepare a sermon and just throw it out and answer questions. See what happens. See how the spirit moves. So, uh, because I got back on Monday and the Fourth of July was on Thursday, I was like, "This is the week <laughs> uh, to do this." So, I'm going to set a, a couple ground rules. First, I have the opportunity to read a question, answer it, and say, "But I need to think more about it," and I'll get back to you. So is that fair? But anything that I pick out of this, I will attempt to answer. Second, I'm going to limit the time window. So I'm going to ask John, who's very good at keeping time, to put 12 <laughs> minutes on the clock. Because okay? I know some of you are really excited about watching the USA and kicking Netherlands behind today in soccer. So I just want to make sure we, we account for that time. Okay. And then the third one is just for you to realize that I'm a human being, okay? And that while these are deep-seated faith questions, just a reminder, not that you need it, that I am not our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, okay? <laughs> so, here we go. The first one is conveniently blank.
church about us being welcomed into the heavenly home. It's not a, a verse of describing what heaven looks like. It's not a verse describing the bodily resurrection that we might or might not experience. It's actually a verse that I carry around with me uh, every day. It's right here on my arm. Uh, it's uh, from Romans, the 8th chapter of the book of Romans. And Paul is talking about um, uh, the conflict in the Roman church, and in particular what keeps people away from God and what keeps people to God. And in the 8th chapter, um, Paul talks specifically about what can keep us away from the, the, the love of, that we find in Christ Jesus. And in verses 38 and 39 of the 8th chapter of the book of Romans specifically, um, Paul has this long diatribe of things that, that might separate us from one another. Uh, things like distance and fear and, and uh, longing or vocation or heights or depths. And he lists all these things that we have used uh, throughout the course of humanity to separate ourselves from other people. Paul ends by saying, none of this can separate us from the love that we have in Christ Jesus. And I think this describes uh, what happens to us after we die. That, that sure, we can be afraid of death, but, but what we can take comfort in and, and know for sure is that even death doesn't separate us from the love that we find in Jesus. Now, I wish I could stand in front of you today and describe to you what heaven looks like and all that kind of stuff. I can't. But what I can say is that I know that I'm going to see you again in heaven because that same love that, that Jesus has for me, Jesus also has for you and has for the world. And that while I want to live and live a long life here on earth because I love my family and I love and I love you, and I love cockroaches, um, <laughs> that I, I look forward to the day when I am reunited with those whom I have lost in my life, in my life because they dwell in that same love for Jesus. That's my first point. <laughs> this is the same handwriting, so that's a little cheating, but that's okay. <laughs> the main reason Jesus came um, I think we could all answer this in different ways um, depending on where we are in our station of life so I'm going to answer this question for me but I think this, is, this would be a great question for you to think about for yourself um, why, did, why did Jesus come for you um, I know that Jesus came for me uh, uh, because I'm a screw up. Um, and not by the things that I do or don't do, because I mess those things up all the time and I kind of live with that. But I know I know that I'm a screw up because I know that that sometimes I believe that I can't be loved. I know I'm a screw-up because there's there's times in my life where I feel like I don't have any value, where I feel like I don't matter, when I feel like I don't have purpose or anything to offer. I, um, I think that Jesus came for me to remind me that in God's eyes, I'm not the screw-up. But all those things that play in my head, uh, all those things that I tell myself, all those inadequate qualities that I feel about myself, that, that, that Jesus came uh, to remind me that, that God forgives me of all those, those things, and that maybe I should spend some time forgiving myself about those things. You know, we could talk about <coughs> biblical history where, where essentially human beings are in this constant pattern of of being told by God what to do and then they don't do what they do and they suffer harm and then God blesses them again and then they do the right thing or told the right thing to do and they don't do the right thing. And, I mean, it's this constant 
particular kind of pattern. I think that Jesus came to break that pattern. Not for even for all of break that pattern for all of humanity, but break that pattern of, of, of negative abuse that I commit against my son. So that's why I think Jesus came. And I and I think that's why Jesus came for for all of us. But I want some more time to think about that. And more fully about well. Was Job a real person, as I thought, or part of a parable, as told by another ELC Dave pastor? Um, it could be both. It very well could be both. And I don't mean that flippantly. Um, it's my belief that Job was a real person. Maybe Job suffered, um, but as any good storyteller who likes to get a point across, maybe Job's, Job's story was exaggerated a bit uh, to talk about uh, God and the providence of God. Or the big question with Job is why does bad thing, why do bad things happen to good people, right? Uh, and maybe the author of the book of Job. Uses Job's real life situation and blows it up a little bit uh, to make the point that he or she, let's get real busy, um, just because at that point in the world, the women's voice wouldn't be lifted up, which is bad, um, to make a point. Um, so that's my answer. I hope you can accept that. Who created God and how? I'll attempt to find that. <laughs> In the beginning, there was nothing but God. I believe that God created God, or God was there. Um, was God created? Uh, that's a very, where's Colin? Colin, that's a very complicated question. Uh, and I admire that you actually asked that question. Um, because not only is that question about God as you might think about God as creator or father or one God, but then there's lots of questions about how was Jesus then created by God or was Jesus present with God all the time and the same as the Spirit? Uh, and there's been many, many theologians and church people who have written about this for many, many years. They fight with each other because uh, because no one really knows. But what I can tell you is that God is God and God is created. God has always been there. That's part of the omnipresence of God, which means that God is everywhere at all times and in all spaces. But it'd be really cool if Tony Stark would have been there. Because then he'd have a cool British accent. Like George. Three minutes. Why? Writing this in for a thread. I think with God, uh, because I tend to be an optimist and believe in the goodness of God, my question isn't why, it's why not. What? Okay. okay. Why not? Alright, this is going to be the last one, but I'm going to save the rest of them for another time. Okay? With all the different religions in the world, how do we know ours is the right one? Um, I am uncomfortable saying that mine is the right one. I just am. Um, what I am comfortable in saying is that uh, this is the right one for me. Um, and my guess is that if you're sitting here today, this is the right one for you. Um, ultimately, I believe that God is, is, is God, and God is undescribable, unfathomable, that we can't fully understand who God is and how God works. I believe that is the same. The same is true with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Um, but because I'm a 
person of faith in the Christian faith tradition, I believe. I try to make sense of the, the world uh, using God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit as my lens, uh, but all that is, is simply an attempt. Why I think that this message of Jesus is the right one for me is because just as I had said before, that the purpose of Jesus is to break into me, to re remind me uh, that I'm loved and that I, I have value and that I'm worth something, I believe that that is the message of Jesus for the world. And I believe that the expression of God through the Christian faith tradition, when it's not distorted to keep people out, is a religion of love, peace, and acceptance. And I would argue with anyone in not fight, because that I don't fight, but I would argue with anyone that when when religion and when Christianity is its purest form, it is absolutely a right expression of God's um, will for the world. Because that right expression includes that concept of love of the world. So Sorry to get through more of these questions. Uh, know that we'll do this again in the fall. Uh, I thank you for your questions. Um, and to kind of conclude our time of, of, of exploration this morning, I'm simply going to ask you to pray with me. So uh, I invite you to a time of prayer. And everyone give John a round of applause for keeping me on track. He does it all the time anyway. So no, it's like, come on, preach. Okay, so uh, let's pray. Most holy and gracious God, we thank you for this day of grace, and we thank you for bringing us uh, here together in this place where we can explore what it means to be uh, a follower of you. God, we, we come to you with, with many questions, some that are written on little slips of paper, some that are too difficult uh, to write on some that we can't even put voice to, God. And we know that sometimes we feel like those questions go unanswered. Or they are answered to our, our fullest uh, desire. But God, that all being said, we, we know and we trust you. Uh, God, you are truly possible. I know, God, I thank you every day uh, for bringing this community of faith community of faith that is safe enough for us to ask these difficult questions. God, I ask that you bless our, our time of worship, uh, the remaining time of worship that we experienced together this morning, uh, that you bless us as we go out into your world to 